I'll wait to see your golden smile. Feel of a thousand kisses. Welcome to this week's episode where we dive into some anchoring techniques and gather information from one of our friends at our marina. While in Kekova, we got to experience anchoring more than a few times. For the most part, we did well and gained a lot of confidence in our abilities, but we also had a few learning opportunities. Our friends too came to our aid on two occasions while anchoring, and we are extremely grateful for that. When we returned to our marina in Finike, he offered to come and share some information and techniques, which is really what this episode is about. Our catamaran came equipped with a couple of Garmin electronics, one of which is our chart plotter. Our chart plotter is configured to our vessel type, length, beam, which is basically the width, and the draft. In other words, how deep is it from the surface of the water to the lowest most point of our boat. The draft is incredibly important to know as it will tell you what is the shallowest bit of water that you can travel over without your bottom touching something and potentially causing a lot of damage. Our chart plotter does not need a Wi-Fi connection to be used while sailing, but there is the ability to connect to Wi-Fi so as to use the chart plotter for other things. The Active Captain app provides a connection between your chart plotter at your helm and a mobile device like a mobile phone or a tablet. The app also allows us to see the same screen we have on our chart plotter at the helm which means we can control the boat from our iPad. We bought an iPad which we use solely for the boat. On it we have weather apps, maps, vessel locator apps, anchorage locator app, route planning apps, etc. Our boat also came equipped with 70 meters of 10 millimeter chain, 30 meters of road, and a 38 kilo mantis anchor. Oh, and we have an electric windlass, which is basically a big electric winch or pulley system that is used to move heavy weight, so we use ours to lower and raise our anchor. We also have a chain counter, which we can control at the anchor locker or at the helm. Lastly, you're also going to hear Stu talking about floating lines and bridles. Floating lines are basically really long ropes that float. They're used by attaching one end to the stern of the boat and the other end to a tree or a rock or some other kind of immovable object on the shore. When you just drop your anchor, your boat is gonna float in the direction away from the wind. But because the boat is connected to a chain that's connected to your anchor, it's only gonna go so far and move within a certain radius around the anchor. It's important to know how much chain you've let out to know how far away from your anchor your boat can eventually move away to. If you know you let out 30 meters of chain and you draw an imaginary circle you can now judge whether there's any objects like other boats that you could collide with that are located within that imaginary circle. Or if anywhere within that circle there's a shallow area or maybe there's some rocks that you need to stay away from. There's more to calculate and to consider in this kind of scenario that I'm giving you, but I'm not going to go further into it in this episode. If you're in a rocky or shallow area or you're at a busy anchorage with a lot of other boaters, free anchoring may not be the ideal way to go because chances are pretty good there's going to be somebody or some thing within your imaginary circle that could cause you trouble. So you then possibly have the option to limit your boat's movements further by securing the bow by using your anchor and securing the stern by tying back to rocks or trees on the shore. Although it typically takes longer to tie back than just free anchoring, there are many benefits to tying back. Bridles are also really important and the subject of our discussion with Stu during this episode. Since we own a catamaran, which as you know has two hulls, then we're going to discuss the bridle setup specific to boats with two hulls. Boats have a tendency to swing when on anchor and at times, depending on the sea state, the swinging can be somewhat jerky. This can make anchoring uncomfortable for the crew, but it can also be dangerous because the jerking motion could conceivably cause the anchor to come loose, which would then allow the boat to drift. The jerking motion can also cause a lot more wear and tear on the parts that make up your ground tackle, which can become pretty expensive. A bridle is a device that will allow each hull to take some of that pressure equally, reducing the tendency to swing with the wind and also minimizing the jerking motion. In this episode, our friend gives us a ton of information and his opinion on what setup works best for him and his boat. Since this episode was shot, we have tried a few different types of setups for our bridle and we feel like we finally found the one that suits us best. Hopefully you will stick around for future episodes so you can see the different setups and see what worked and what didn't work for us. Right, so let's just let this out of the the out a little.
So let's take this apart. So all this is, is a Dyneema loop. This is like, they call it a ring or antel ring, a different branded type rings. You actually don't need the ring, but that just is a nice addition. And you can just have a loop of Dyneema, the thickest one you can get is like probably this, about this thick. It looks like about a centimeter or more minimum, I'd say. Then instead of having what you got, which is actually a weak point in a way, if it gets stuck in rock or something like that and it bends the wrong way, who knows? I don't actually know strength of this. Maybe it's fine, but I've had a lot of bad experiences with metal hook. Whether they get stuck here or whether they get cause problems underwater, uh, I'm not. I'm not a fan of them at all. So I'm just going to put it here. So about the monkey bar. The, the claws, even yeah. worse in my opinion. Really? I don't know the strength of this, but really, the reason why I don't like the claws and the big hooks, they get stuck in this area here, this this area here, in the worst possible moment in the storm, that hook gets stuck in this area, like wedged. Right, yeah. I've had to go fetch hammers and knock them out. I've had to do all sorts of things in storms. So this, what I'm going to show you now, overcomes all of these type of issues. This is a loop. And all you have to do, it's very simple, I think it's called a hitch knot, hitch loop. I don't even know what it's called, but it's, it's really just going through twice. Okay. So to take it off, you kind of go the other way to loosen it a bit. Yeah. So that's a loop and you just go through twice. And then you take your Dyneema loop, which is of similar strength. Well, that's about a similar st uh, strength one. Mm -hmm. The Dyneema is actually thicker than your chain or about the same thickness as your chain. Right. Therefore, it's as strong as your chain. Okay. And then all you do is you go through here go through and connect it to your bridle like that okay it's a little bit longer process but once it's done there's not likely to be any sort of danger of it breaking or slipping now that doesn't snag on much even if it does snag it doesn't matter because it's it's not going to break and this is called a ring but or antle ring or low friction ring yeah and all they've done here is they've got the loop and they've added this on if you pull this back you can see how they've just stitched through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Put something just to keep it together. It could be you could use anything like small uh, D shackle or anything just to clamp, clamp it on together. here, or anything right. to clamp it on here to keep it. There's something stainless, or like they've got here. You don't have to have the anti ring, but I mean, look, this is last this year. Like, and it's attached to the black line, which right. is yeah. the so bridle. Yeah. And then you use a normal. This is called a, a soft loop, like a soft shackle, basically. Yeah. It's called a soft shackle. I mean, you can actually make these. We've made a couple of these in the past, but I've forgotten. Them. But you can. One of the sailors who I was discussing this just said, look, if, if that breaks, by the time that breaks, there's going to be other complications already on the boat. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it shouldn't break, but yeah, I would not go with, I'd go with 8 or 10 more. This is just really a safest solution. It's like getting, you know, now you put this tight thing, you've got the short. No, you want to get, getting it off is the problem. So when it's tight, you have to go backwards, one loop, and then it becomes easier to take off. Okay. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. So we're going to anchor out here, which is where I anchor quite often out. Settings and alarms, navigation, anchor drag. Okay, and once you put it on, it'll immediately put a radius around your boat. Okay, uh -huh. that will give you an idea of what structures nearby. So, and you can change your radius. We've just discussed how much scope we're always going to do minimum three scope. So let's just assume that's going to always be 30. Before you put out your bridle, that becomes 40. To judge what you're going to hit, you want minimum 50, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to go 50 times 3 is 150. So 150 is exactly right, but you don't want to hit your alarm, right, to make a noise all the time when you're in the boat. So you're going to put one bigger. That's so 50 foot. Yeah, so I'm going to now 200 foot, which is 75 meter radius, which is actually getting quite big now. But it gives you an idea what you're going to hit. Okay, so now put it around yourself. It's not where you're going to anchor. You're still planning. So mm -hmm. you're going to move this now. And you move the center. Okay, now you literally just drag where you want to be anchoring. And you can hopefully zoom out. Okay, so you can plan ahead where you're going to anchor. And you can see on, on your radar, this is another monohull here. You don't want to be close to him. So you are like <clears throat> something like this. The monohull's on the edge of my radius. The wind's blowing this like this direction. Mm -hmm. If he's already there, he's never going to get close to me because the wind's going that direction. So you choose your spot and you set the center. Now you go back and you go out again, home, okay. 
Okay, so now let's assume our boat is here and you're dropping now. We're anchoring in about 10 meters, you say. You make sure the anchor's ready, right? Right. But I'm not driving at speed and letting out chain. You never do that. It's now you're just crawling along into the center now. Yeah. And he's going to just drop and drop until you tell him to stop. You're going to be watching the counter now. And as that counter hits the depth of this, what the chart tells you here roughly, and what your depth sounder tells you, just you press mark. Uh -huh. Okay, now let's just assume that made a mark there. Okay, so now you've got your mark where that anchor hit the ground. Uh -huh. okay. That's quite very handy when you're in a congested area. Yeah, so let's say you're in 10 meters of water, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm at the anchor. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna let down nine, and then when it's at nine, then she starts reversing. He's right now, he's just, <clears throat> he wants to mark on this map where the anchor touches sand. Yeah, and where so, the driver puts the anchor. It's much easier for a driver to put in the right so place. So that's what I'm asking. You don't move until the, the anchor hits ground. I will drive slowly along here. When at, and I've let out five. Once I get close enough, I've already got five meters, half of the distance down minimum. Or let's say it's, I'm now on the mark in the middle, but just before, because I know I'm drifting this way now. As I get there, I've let out the full the 10 meters. In. And as it, I see the 10 meters on my counter, Comes a lot, you know, especially in the beginning when you're, for me it's easy. Like it's less hassle than talking to lens than it is for me to just do it myself and it'll become like that for you. But at the minute, at now, as, as when you're starting, it's like too many things going on. Uh -huh. So it'd be good for you to just handle the letting out the windlass yourself. When she says, okay, start letting it out fast now, then she knows she's getting drifting close to the center anyway. She's very close. She knows when it, when you arrive at 10 meters, she's going to be at the center anyway. So it's kind of like she would be doing it. It's just saving her, taking her hand away from controls. Right. That's yeah. what it is. And then now you've got it on the chart and this comes in handy a little bit later. So now you've, you're down and now you don't stop letting out, right? Now you're just gonna let out your thing. I want the wind to push me to a direction, but in a cat, this process is slower. It kind of like just takes you, drifts you around before it gets you to direction. Mm -hmm. So you can aid it, you can okay, turn it around, reverse it a little bit, but you're doing this all very slowly because you don't want to move your anchor from that position before your three times road is out. Okay. So you don't want to be doing too much to pick it up or pull the chain around or whatever. You want the chain to let out. Mm -hmm. You're reversing very, very slowly or nothing because the wind is strong. You don't need to do any reversing. Okay, so in this point it says 10 meters, you lift out your 30 and then um, you will be shouting. Okay, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, stop. Okay, and he's going to go then and put on the bridle. And uh, after that, then again, you have to make sure you're in line with the wind. There's no point going being this way and pulling it in this unless you want to test something. But you're actually only going to be rotating in this area. This is just to give you a safety factor and so it doesn't hassle you with lots of noise dragging all the time okay because sometimes the gps will lose um, connection for whatever reason and it'll bounce like five meters now first you get your 2000 revs it's not been going like massive in the beginning first you check it's stable you don't want to go too fast first you don't want to like rip the thing up and give yeah, it a fright right. right so you're going steady Easy. back to 2000. once you see you've stable you're in direction of the wind I always put something, two things together to see if I'm moving. Get two things, you're lining them up to see, okay, that tree or that, and that part of the mountain, and now I'm reversing and I'm checking. That's one way of doing it, and you can also see with the water movement, if you're, you're dragging. I'll zoom in maximum. Now, every one of these little dots on the screen is a distance of a couple of meters. You know, every, every dot like there is like two meters. I don't know how much it is, okay? You zoom in to there, okay, and you're watching. If one dot appears, I'm dragging. Don't fool yourself, you're dragging. Right. <laughs> okay. If you've got a 200 revs and another dot appears, yeah, you're that means dragging. you're moving. Yeah. Yeah. You're dragging. So, I mean, you're going to leave it there. You're not going to assume immediate drag because now you're going to pick up the tension. It's going to will drag two meters in this digging in process anyway. Okay. Right. Like your mantis, that thing sets instantly. So it's, you don't, it's, it's very sharp and it's like instant. So you don't drag much. Okay. okay. Now you go maximum and you watch it. You don't worry if things are going to break or whatever. You go maximum and you watch it, okay, and you see how the, if the dots appear. How long do you, do, do you do that for? Like five seconds. Like, you know, lens gets apprehensive because, you know, the person in the front sees a bridle come out the water. And it's like, it's like aggressive, but actually, I mean, you, you should be testing your boat. Like I said to you before, you want your bridle to break. You want everything to break on the boat when you are testing it. Right. Not in a storm. Right, right. <laughs> so you, what if we did drag? Start again. And then you reset. 
We I would literally just start completely again. To so pull all the way up? Yeah, okay. because there's many reasons why you could be dragging. You could have dropped on an obstacle that you keep pulling with you, mm -hmm. and now you just flick it, and next time you do it, you just move a little bit and you flick it and it sets, or you've, you've chosen a very bad area by bad luck. For many reasons, it could be like, I don't know, I just don't believe in, in continuing the process. Never let out too little chain rather let out too much chain you are looking at your chain counter you know that now we are putting on the bridle you've looked at the distance is 30 meters mm -hmm. you know your boat and, you, and your bridle is seven meters of extra chain okay you're not going to risk it are you you're going to put out 10 because if you don't have enough chain let out now you're, you're on your windlass she's going back at two and a half maybe the thing miscommunicates or doesn't work at the time and she goes two and a half and now she's pulling your windlass at a hell of a um, strain okay and not only that in a, in a storm, you've got to let out too much, uh, very importantly, because that whiplash happens. Your wind is coming and it blows you back and it's smashed, and now your bridle whips up. And if you haven't let out enough, it's like as if pulling you don't even that. have a bridle. Right, you just pull yeah. on that. Uh, so, we need, so do 10 meters on a bridle at a minimum? Yeah, it's right. normally for my boat, I know the optimum amount. Your boat will be different. Depends on the length of your bridle. You will know, you'll learn it. You're, you're always going to let out too much. It's a safety factor. Then at the two and a half thousand reps, you can see how much hang there is. You don't want too much hang, especially when you've got a shit hook. Right. So when she's at two and a half thousand reps back, it should be a comfortable, like that's the worst. Even in a storm, it's not going to be much worse than that. As long as there's some slack, then it's good. You, you don't want it to be too long either because now it's going to start catching the rocks on right. shallow edges. Because then that's become another problem. Imagine now it's catching rocks. Now again, all the pressure's on your windlass. So now when you come back, same procedure. As it gets to 10 meters, I put the mark as it arrives. He's dropping and I've marked the spot. Okay, and it's tight. That's good. Now she's going to manually let it out, manually let out on the counter, chain backwards, feeling comfortable as she goes backwards, backwards, backwards. Okay, we at the spot now, stop. At that point, you need to be ready to jump in the water. <laughs> Aquaman. <laughs> when it's warm. <laughs> yeah. You need to be ready to or jump in the water. Go. You gotta get your flippers. Yeah, I got them. I don't often use flippers. It is good, but if you're going to climb anything, it's difficult. Okay. Flippers, yeah. yeah. So it's like catch twenty two again. That's why very important floating line. And uh, I'm better just with water shoes. Thing. Yeah, I'd, I'll jump in with water shoes and swim it there. It depends, you know. Like if you're if you're tying below sea level, you know, level then definitely just use uh, your fins, and it's easier. But a lot of the time you have to tie above and then it's become fins are pain. You've got to take them off and put them somewhere to climb up. And I don't tie it tight now. The whole objective at this point, because now you're going to have to move away from there. You're going to have your lines. Already ready. Your lines are going to be lying down there. They're not going to be just hanging off the back, okay? They're going to be going over your cleat out the side like that. As you swimming out, you're going to be pulling it. So it's going to be a bit of a fight, but she's going to help you. If there's not a lot of wind, you don't do this type of stuff in the beginning when there's wind. You do it like when there's calm days. Now you've got to stay focused because you can't let the boat drift onto the rocks at this point. No matter how much he needs your help, it's irrelevant. Let him drown. You've got to kind of... <laughs> <laughs> she would. <laughs> and then she'd sail the boat. Well, and get my life and... Here's your, here's your strap. This is what you're going to put around the rock. Now you've got your floating line to your boat. You can just tie it tight, right? How big is your loop then? It's that big. How can I make the loop bigger? By making my bowline knot extremely large. Okay. So the loop that's tying onto the bowline is like this. So now, that's my strap. It allows me to to open this up more. So this is the fireman hose, basically. Yeah. yeah. And this is yeah. the line. Choker. Yeah. So if this is big and fat loop here, I can have a wide strap around the rock. It doesn't have to be closed is my point. Right. Now you can go around a bigger rock. So I make a very big bow and I tie it off far away. So you've got another loop. I don't know how big this is, but it's a minimum like three meter loop. There'll be another three meter loop. Now you can make it much bigger and you've got more flexibility of getting around things. <laughs> you don't do these knots. This is just I for that. Yeah. Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Granny knots. Okay. When you're doing what I'm saying, I'm just going to Illustrated, like be silly about it. It's like making your big bow. Yeah. So, like this, Around, like this. Back to it. What I mean is, I'm just creating an excessive loop on this side. Now, normally this would be tight. You'd have your knot like this. No, you have it big. Okay. So that you can open this. And put it around. No, it's very big. 
and go around a rock. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a much bigger rock now. Now this three meters suddenly is, is, is five meters. You, you only want this rope to touch the, your, your, your floating line is not tough enough for, it, it will last, it, I, I do use it, for, but you can't use floating line underwater. It, it's an absolute nightmare. You must imagine trying to get this thing around a rope, shouting to the person on shore to pull tight. Every time they're not pulling fast enough, the thing's floated over oh, again. Yeah. And it, it's an absolute nightmare trying to get So it. this could be the floating line, but this one not. This must be floating line. Yeah. This but must this be floating. one must. That was a threat. Yes. What's the smallest rock that you would you would go around? Does it matter? As long as it's connected to the earth. To earth, it's great. Yes. Like, I mean, you, you'll see like something like this coming out of the earth. There's many of them, but it mustn't be your only one. Like if it's only this, like it's, you know, it's been there for centuries or, you know, probably centuries. How many boats have really moved on this thing and survived? It's already gone through a lot. It's right? still there. So it's yeah. still there. Yeah. It's very solid because it's part of a mountain. It goes and it just gets big, 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 big right. at the bottom. As long as you see that that shape, then it's okay. We actually noticed when the last time we went out that there were a lot of metal hooks that were con put into concrete into the boulders by locals so that oh, boats could use that to tie on to. They made their own more.